In this video, I'm talking to two people who have serious experience of the care sector, the nursing and residential homes sector. One has a vast number of homes that he is in charge of, and one is a smaller operator with fewer homes. I'd like to welcome Tony Stein from Healthcare Management Solutions and Chris Mitchell from Park Lane Healthcare. Gentlemen, welcome. Good morning. Right, firstly, let's ask you each to tell us what are your homes doing? What's going on in your homes in the current climate? Tony Stein first. Oh, right, right. Yes, it's, um, it's difficult times. We, we're, we're very, very busy, as you can imagine. We're, it's a difficult and serious business of looking after and caring for people's loved ones. And um, in the best of times, um, it's a challenge. Obviously, with the current epidemic, um, it's uh, multiplied that, that, that kind of <coughs> workload. So there are a number of things that we're finding, finding it very difficult not allowing residents to see their relatives. That's, that's quite difficult for them. And it's difficult for our staff. Um, obviously, there's the anxiety around the infection and how it's impacting on the, on the staff group and how it's impacting on the, the residents, particularly where they're not used to seeing people wandering around in PPE. Um, there are lots of issues that add to the normal day-to-day -day challenge of looking after people with uh, often uh, challenging health conditions. So uh, I would say it's, it's not business as usual by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's difficult times, but I'm really proud, I have to say this, of the way that the staff teams have risen to this challenge and demonstrated a degree of professionalism that actually warrants warrants more serious recognition generally in the public. And I should say that Tony, you're the larger of the two people we're talking to in terms of the business, the three three thousand plus residents and staff. Chris Mitchell, Park Lane Healthcare has facilities in Yorkshire and the North, uh, not quite as many. But what's your answer? How are your homes doing in the current climate? Well, as I, as I always say to the, the girls on Facebook and stuff like that, I've got the easy job. You know, I'm on the phone morning, noon and night, WhatsApps and, and uh, texts and phone calls and stuff. But they've got the, the tough job on the, on the front line. What I'm finding, um, morale is good. Um, I mean, everybody in the UK is fine at the moment, but morale is good. Um, the girls are, are, are up, for, up to the task. I mean, if anywhere uh, is trained in infection control, control and, uh, and systems and procedures in this modern era it's carers and senior carers and care home managers many of whom have been with us for about 16 years and so you know we've got healthy dialogue the homes themselves they're a cocoon um, yes there's no relatives in at the moment sadly and very very few visitors other than of course district nurses and people like that but at the moment it's good um, morale is good um, I don't sometimes recognise some of the things that I see on the TV, uh, but I understand that there's a hard time being had by a lot of people. Let's pick up on what the media are saying about care homes. You've got respected commentators yeah. on national television. You've got big newspaper articles. The phrase war zone is in common yeah, yeah. parts. What have each of you got to say about that? Tony first. Oh, I, I, I hate this kind of sensationalist uh, language. I think... Um, it's difficult enough um, to to carry on and deliver, you know, a really good uh, quality uh, and and professional service without being bombarded day, you know, day day and night with this kind of imagery. It's not there's it's not my experience. It's not the experience of our staff. Um, if you look at the um, the way that they've responded, I think to some extent people tend to try and go the other way to balance it out. So you see an awful lot of stuff now coming out on social media um, of, of staff enjoying themselves with the residents. It, it's the reality of life. It's a challenge delivering the care, but, but they still get a huge amount out of the relationships that they've got with their residents, their service users. And the morale is very good. And I would agree with Chris on that, that I think you know, we should be seeing a little bit more of this. Um, the big risk, of course, is that if you keep telling people that their job is, a, is horrendous, then eventually it's going to start to stick. And that is not the case. It genuinely is not the case. You went on a national TV broadcast and um, 
tried to put some of these points, but all of the questions were about the negative, weren't they? Well, people people like that. That it seems as though that seems to feed the general media. And actually, you know, I think difficult times call for cool heads. You know, and and Chris is the same as myself. You know, we'll sit and we'll work morning, noon, and night, no problem, in in trying to overcome problems. Um, but actually, the the you know, overcoming a problem isn't a crisis. It's just, it's just something that you've got to manage and you've got to deal with. And that's how it should be. And that's how it is generally. Okay, I've got to move on to the next bit because we've only got 10 minutes on LinkedIn videos. So uh, let's move on to uh, how you're each keeping your homes uh, stimulated because of course the residents are the most important and you, you can't have them just locked up as, uh, in, in this sort of uh, benign but nevertheless boring environment. So what are you doing? Chris first, what's happening in the homes to keep people active? Well, I, I would just like to come back on the previous point, if I may, because, you know, something that I've been saying all along is, is, is that, you know, the press have a responsibility to, uh, to, to report, to challenge government and so on. But just when care homes were, were getting a better reputation, so and quite deservedly so, you know, we want to be front and centre and this, crisis has put us front and centre but at the end of the day you know I've, I've written down that if the virus doesn't kill us then the press will because you know people are thinking gosh you know, I'd rather do anything than to put my mum or my gran in a care home now and and that is could not be further from the truth so I just wanted to add that to the, to the that's previous point, point. Um, what I would mum is in the care home what care is she getting well, exactly. I mean, the, I'm seeing karaoke and doing the conga. The girls are always doing Facebook videos and, and all sorts of stuff, demonstrating, which is what goes on in normal, in normal life. There was once a, a, a clip of somebody dancing with a care assistant that went viral. And I said, gosh, we do that every single day. That, that, that's life in a care home. I can honestly report, and I'm sure Tony says the same, that, that inside those care homes, you would not know outside of those doors there was a crisis going on. All right. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. Tony? Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. You know, I, I think the bit that, that I see is, is the anxiety of the staff, you know, and they're worried for their residents. That's what it's about. And, and we're managing that through, through constant communication with our teams, you know, ensuring that they've got the PPE that they need, you know, ensuring that they, they understand the guidance that's being put out there. But, but that's aside from day-to-day -day life. And as Chris rightly says, that for the vast majority of our clients, we're trying to make it so that apart from not being able to see their residents, there's so little, if any, interruption to their normal daily lives that, that actually, you know, this crisis almost is going on outside. It's, it's something separate from the home. Yeah. So if you've, got your, if you've got a loved one in a home, I would have to say this, you know, you should not be worried. You should not be worried. In the second part of our conversation now with Tony Stein and uh, Chris Mitchell, two care home owners, one uh, of a larger number and one of a smaller number, let's talk about some of the issues that have cropped up. First of all, PPE. Candidly, what problems have you had, if any, in getting PPE into your homes? Chris first. I've seen a lot of uh, stuff on the Sky News and all the other, all the other media where PPE is a real, real problem. Um, and uh, surely it is, you know, when you, when you, when you see, see and hear what you do. Personally, back in January, we planned as best we could for this. Um, there are still challenges at the moment, we feel, without a COVID outbreak in any of our homes at the moment, God willing, that stays the same. We feel that we've got enough supply for two to three months. If we got an outbreak, God forbid, that would change. But at the moment, talking personally, we feel that we're okay at the moment for PPE. We just secured yesterday another 10,000 high quality face masks, um, which are frightening for residents a little bit because they're not used to seeing us dressed that way. But they, the residents are of no risk to us whatsoever. The risk is outsiders coming into the home and that's what we jump all over all of the time. And as Tony says, people looking at this and looking at the news should not feel in one iota that there's a fear to coming into a care home. We're all over everything. Tony, let's pick up on you then. You've got nine more uh, homes to deal with than Chris. Chris has a handful of good quality homes, but you have 3,000 plus residents. And yeah, 3,000. So we're, we're 80 services, uh, 78 services as of today. 
Um, we are um, we are managing to source PPE for our for our homes, um, but put it into perspective, these fluid resistant masks, for example, we get through a hundred thousand a week of these masks. So sourcing these is a major issue for us. The price has just gone up from around 18 pence a mask to somewhere in the region of 74 pence a mask. So that's in context, that's just for masks alone, 74 grand a week that we're spending. We're managing to find them. Um, they're all being air freighted now. So that's added hugely to the cost because we're desperately short in the country. Um, I have to say that in Scotland, Scottish government's finally got on top of this and they're delivering masks to our homes, which is very good of them. Um, and other PPE. Um, we are, as, as Chris rightly says, we have COVID-19 in some of the homes and, uh, and residents are being isolated and they're being uh, looked after and therefore we're using more PPE in those homes. We're managing, we're managing, it's difficult, but we're on top of it. I think, um, you know, more needs to probably be done by government to help to, to get supplies into the country. Um, the big issue at the moment seems to be shipping stuff out of China. And I think that requires a government response. Uh, but just for now, yeah, we're managing, um, albeit it's very, very expensive, very expensive. Okay, let's talk about infection control. Um, if you have a resident who has COVID-19 symptoms, what are you able to do to make sure that that is controlled? So Chris first, let's, I know Tony's had a lot of experience, so let's talk to Chris first and then Tony. Okay, I mean, the, 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 one of the keys is to have an ensuite facility with, with all of your rooms and to, in the vast, vast majority of cases that's what we've got because that makes isolation easier. We barrier anybody who comes into the home as a new resident now for 14 days when they first come in um, and continue to barrier until safe, we consider it safe to do so with no evidence whatsoever that the resident has any symptoms of COVID-19. The, the infection control, we're well used to it. I mean, people, it went to sort of under the radar, but MRSA uh, was a big issue a few years ago. Norovirus and, and flu, influenza, pneumonia are, big, are, are, are every year uh, recurring problems. And it's something that we're used to. It's business as usual. I think an analogy, because we're using war and, 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 and so on analogies, is, is the fact that, you know, Whenever, like in the Falklands War or the Gulf War, you speak to the troops out there and they couldn't wait to get started because everything they've been trained for, they were able to carry out in real time. Now, we don't want COVID-19 in the homes, but at the same time, we're ready for it. And that's really, you know, the girls are up for it. They're, they're, I'm so proud of them, honestly. Super. Now, Tony, you've had more experience uh, in this because you have had several uh, cases um, obviously, you've heard what, uh, what Chris had uh, to say about the methodologies. Uh, have those methodologies been put into practice in your case? Yes, they have. And, and, and actually, the, 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 the statistics, are, um, for our, for, at least for ourselves, are, are very um, um, are, are sort of positive. I won't say, you know, they're very good because there's, obviously there are people who've passed away who've had symptoms. And again, I would emphasise it. They're only symptomatic. We haven't had testing yet. Um, but yeah, so um, we, we're seeing a lot of people recovering. Um, we isolate and bury a nurse, so we make sure people uh, are distanced from the other residents. And, and I'm delighted to say that, that a large majority of them, you know, have, have, they go through the, 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 the COVID-19 um, uh, fever, if you like, and, and symptoms, and then come out the other side, so that's good. Um, it, obviously, it's difficult in, it, it, for anybody to be isolated in a in a um, any situation, but what I would say is that the elderly people in a care home scenario, when they're isolated because they've got CV nineteen, uh, at least are seeing staff on a regular basis and being cared for whilst they go through the the, the, the disease. Okay, so we've talked about PPE, we've talked about infection control. Finally, uh, let's discuss the issue of testing and the government this week. Um, appearing now to have a more systematic way of getting these tests to your staff and your people in the nursing homes. Let's talk about what you've done. Tony first. Yeah, yeah so superb news last night, um, testing for staff and their relatives. That's the, that's the game changer. Testing of, of, of residents, I've always said, was interesting from a statistical point of view. But since we treat everybody with symptoms as if they have the disease anyway, 
um, it's not really going to change much. Um, but what will change dramatically for us is the fact that if, if somebody is having to self-isolate at home for 14 days because a member of their family is symptomatic, we can now get them tested and hopefully back into the, into the um, home if that test turns out negative. So that's extremely important. And I'm delighted that the government announced yesterday that they were going to have this testing. And um, I'm also delighted to know that, that um, we're in a position now where we can log on online, we can book those tests on behalf of our staff, and within 48 hours, so that's, the, that's the sort of time scale we're talking about, we'll know once and for all whether that person can rejoin the, the workforce. So very, very positive. Chris Mitchell? Yeah, I'd say much the same. I've been saying for a while that it's the silver bullet. I mean, the testing and the tracing is a, is a silver bullet now. I said to everybody last night, I had a spring in my step following yesterday's government announcement because you know, one can now see a, a real path to some kind of normality, not just in, in the, for the general public, but for care homes too, uh, which are part of the general, you know, general public and the, and the community. But there's a, a clear pathway now. I think the government are right to, to keep us where, where we are. And I think the, as a Sky poll showed, overwhelming majority of people support the government because it's scary. It is scary. But if we all follow these procedures and we use the testing and the tracing, if the government deliver as they say they're going to do, I think it's a whole new leaf turned over yesterday. And I'm very excited about it, to be honest. So are you saying, Chris, and what's your view, Tony, as well, that you think that the lockdown should be kept at this level? Or I do. do you think there's a time that it's got to raise? Because you're in one sector, there's lots of other sectors that are very concerned about the future. I know, but nothing is more valuable than life. And I think this crisis has taught us that. I'm a businessman too. It is a, it is a commercial company as well as being a caring business. And I get that. But at the end of the day, if we're to secure it for the longer term, I think sometimes the pills that you have to swallow are there, and I think that they need to be honest with the British public. It's not safe to go out yet. At the time when it was all somebody in their 80s and 90s or with pre-medical conditions and old, people in general across the country felt safe. It's proven since then it is an epidemic, a pandemic that can get anybody, however healthy they are, our own Prime Minister. And I think that that's gone into the psyche of the British people. Let's eradicate it to the lowest possible levels then bring it back out with the tracing and the testing, and then we get some sort of form of normality until the vaccine arrives. And God willing, these guys in Oxford are going to deliver that sooner rather than later. Tony? Yeah, I, well, I, I look at it very similarly, but I also say that from a, from a financial point of view, the country has invested billions now, billions in this lockdown. And to release it early with the risk that we go right back to base one, yeah. With, another, with another spike of, of infection around the country is nonsense to me. You, you don't throw away that investment. You know, and if, if the, 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 the worst thing you could do is come out too early. If we came out a little bit too late, yes, there'll be additional costs, but actually that's the lesser of the two evils. Um, and actually, I'm not a great one for pushing the government either for an exit plan, because although people want certainty, the reality is that the exit plan will change daily as our situation changes. So as the, as the infection rate changes, as tracing changes, as vaccination gets closer, as, as uh, testing gets better. So, you know, let's not, we've invested such a huge amount as a country now, let's not push too quickly to throw that away. Gentlemen, thank you for talking to us and stay safe and thank you for the work you're doing, which so often in the case of your staff, is not remarked upon in the same way as the NHS, but I think we can reflect it today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Tony.